or who is recording today? Yep. Oh, okay. Yep, we're recording now. Okay. Um, so welcome everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Mario, Mario Schmirek from Rutgers University. And he's gonna talk about dimension-free estimates for the discrete hardy little with maximal functions. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to, to give this talk today. Uh, so I'm going to talk uh, about some recent progress on the dimension-free estimates for the hardy little maximal functions. And so let me, let me start from some, some overview. Uh, uh, so, uh, so we'll consider G, this will be uh, a non-empty convex symmetric body, which means that simply this is a bounded convex uh, closed and centrally symmetric subset of, of the, of the D-dimensional um, Euclidean space with non-empty interior. So usually in the literature, it's, it's assumed that this is open, but because we uh, will consider also the discrete setup. So from there are some technical reasons that it's, it's, it's good to, it's better to assume that this is closed. And, and so, so, the, so this is what we are going to do. And now for, and now we will consider the, the following hard liquid averaging operator over the lattice point in the dilated uh, body G. And so this is, the, this is the average of this form and the summation is taken over all lattice points in GT. And GT, this is the dilation of our convex um, symmetric body. This is the, the usual definition. And uh, so, and now at this moment, it's natural to think that this operator, this average, discrete average, uh, this is a discrete analog of, of integral hard delitude averaging operator, which is defined in this way as a integral over GT um, of the function f of evaluated at x minus y. And uh, now the main question, uh, concerns the behavior of the optimal constant in the maximal inequality corresponding to, to this uh, discrete operator, as well as continuous one. So what, let me first start with the discrete one. So C, P, D, comma, G, this is the best constant in this inequality. And the question is about the behavior of this constant when D goes to infinity. And uh, so more precisely for a given P, which is a parameter uh, between one and infinity, including infinity, we ask about the existence of a universal constant such that for every dimension and every convex symmetric body, we have this inequality. And of course, if P is equal to infinity, then this, this the optimal constant is equal to one because we are dealing with the averaging operators. So there is, so this is, this is obvious and on the other hand, we can also uh, appealing to, for instance, to the to the covering argument at p equal one, um, we can conclude that this operator was, is weak type one one. So therefore, this this, this optimal constant is finite. But uh, unfortunately, at so this this argument doesn't say anything reasonable about about the um, uh, dimension dependence on, on, on D. I mean that dimension independence. Uh, so because at, at uh, on, on L1, uh, for instance, if we appeal to the, to the Vitalis um, covering argument, then um, this argument produces the exponential growth in D. So therefore by interpolation, we have exponential growth. Of course, this can be, this can be um, improved, um, but still, uh, it's completely unknown at this moment what happens uh, at the at the end point uh, in the general case. I will tell you in a moment a few words about uh, when we will specifically discuss the, the cubes for uh, for p equal one. Uh, then mm, we have some definitive definite uh, definitive result. So, but I, I will tell you in, in a moment about that. So, and now let me uh, tell you the story 
um, about the behavior of the optimal constant in the, in the continuous setup. So um, here, well, uh, of course, now, now we consider the, the, the continuous hardly limit averaging operator and we ask about the behavior of the optimal constant in the, hard, in the usual continuous hardly liquid um, inequality. And now the problem is about the estimates of this optimal constant as d goes to infinity. And this problem uh, has been studied by several authors for nearly four decades. And so let me start from the, from the case of the Euclidean balls. And so in the 1980s, Eli Stein showed that the optimal constant in the hard liquid averaging operator over the Euclidean balls uh, is, can be taken independent of the dimension for every parameters between one and infinity. But it's not B2, it should be BD or um, your ball. B, B2, I'm saying that this is- uh, What is B2? This is, this is B2. Okay, so th this, this means that this is the ball, which is Euclidean ball, which is induced by the Euclidean metric. Because oh, after oh, you I consider me, the two, B2, two is okay. the Q balls, when we'll, they, they, they will be induced by the small Q norm. Salmon, uh, uh, salmon, salmon okay. chicken salmon. Okay, okay. It's, it's just metric. Two is the metric. Okay, I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is two, this is, this, 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 uh, this is the yeah. metric. That's right. And so, and this, that was the starting point of this, of the, um, of this line of research. And not long afterwards, Bourguin showed that for P equal to this optimal constant in the hard liquid um, inequality for the operators taken over all convex symmetric bodies is independent of the dimension. And, uh, <clears throat> um, uh, and this result was extended by Carberry and independently by Bourguin to the dimension free bounds for this optimal constant for all P bigger than three half. Um, and so far, this is the most general, what we can say when we ask about the, um, about um, convex uh, symmetric bodies in, in R. And Bourguin and Carberry also showed that if we consider the lacunary version of the hard liquid maximal operator, so if, if we restrict ourselves to, to the lacunary times of this formula, the di which are the dyadic numbers, two to the n, then this, uh, then here in this case, uh, the constant um, can be taken independent of the dimension for all convex symmetric bodies. And uh, and for all p bigger than one, so so in this case, this is this is this problem is is completely uh, resolved. And now, hmm, uh, so now, so it's conjectured that that there is a uh, constant uh, independent of the dimension that for all convex symmetric bodies, this optimal. Um, this the, the the best constant in the in the maximal hard little maximal inequality um, can be bounded independent of the dimension, and so it's it's reasonable to believe that this is true, because it was verified for a large class of convex symmetric bodies. And now let's consider the the Q balls in R D, so that are the balls which are induced by small L Q metrics. So for instance for for when Q is equal to, then this is the usual Euclidean ball. When Q is equal infinity, then this, is, this corresponds to the, to the case of cubes. And in this case, when we consider Q balls, then the full range, uh, and we consider all Q between one and infinity, excluding infinity, so the full range of P um, um, was, uh, in the full range of P, it was shown that the optimal constant is independent of the dimension. And th that, that's the result of Detlef Miller from the 1990s. Unfortunately, uh, Miller's uh, result um, say nothing about the, about the endpoint, what happens for Q equal infinity when, when G 
is a um, is a is a cube, and this uh, um, at some point people believed that this is this should be the counter example to this uh, to this conjecture, but Bourguel in two thousand twelve showed that uh, in the case of balls, in the case of cubes, I'm sorry, uh, for all p between bigger than one, uh, we have dimension free estimates in the hardy liquid um, uh, maximal inequality. And so here, what is important that uh, when we consider the case of balls, the case of cubes for p equal one, then ALDAS uh, showed that uh, the best constant in the weak type one one inequality uh, for the hardy liquid maximal operator over the cubes is uh, grows uh, to infinity with the dimension. And so, um, so therefore in this case, at, 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 the, at the end point for p equal one, we don't have dimension free uh, estimates. Uh, okay, and now, so this problem is very, so in this problem, what is important, uh, mm, the concept of, of uh, uh, isotropic constant uh, arise, uh, arises very naturally. And so let me tell you what the isotropic constant is and what the isotropic position of the, um, of the symmetric body is. So we say that a convex symmetric body uh, is in the isotropic position if it has measure one and there exists a constant depending only on G such that if we consider the average of the inner product of X and C raised to the power two, then this is proportional to the length of the vector C mm, and, the, and the proportionality constant this is precisely the, the, the number, which is the proportionality constant is called the isotropic constant of G. And one can show that for every convex symmetric body, there exists a linear transformation of RD such that the image of G is in the isotropic position, which means that this, this identity holds. And now if we consider, if we, if we define the isometry um, on LP in this way, then we can see that, and, and we conjugate our hard liquid operator, then we see that the, the conjugation of the hard liquid operator, uh, this is the hard liquid operator at UG, and now UG is in the, in the isotropic position. So therefore this identity shows that we can always assume that our symmetric body is in the isotropic position. And, this, and also this identity shows that this, the best constant in the, in the maximal inequality corresponding to this operator and corresponding to this operator, they're the same. So therefore we can assume from this, from now on we can assume that um, our uh, convex symmetric body is in, in, the, in the isotropic position. So this will be very important. And now let me make a digression about, the, about this isotropic constant. So we know, as Bourguin showed, that there is a universal constant independent of the dimension, such that for all convex symmetric bodies, the isotropic um, in the isotropic position we have that the we have the lower bound, and the isotropic conjecture asks about the upper bound, and so there is so we ask if there is a constant independent of the dimension, such that for all convex symmetric bodies G, which are in the isotropic position, we have that the isotropic constant is bounded by, by this absolute constant. And uh, of course, this conjecture was also verified for uh, various classes of convex symmetric bodies. For instance, it's, it's true for all Q balls. And so the best what we know to date, this is the result of Clartac from 2006, which says that this isotropic constant behaves like dimension to one quarter. And and this is and this is the best what we what we know in this in this generality, and so this this problem is uh, still open, and now um, let me tell you uh, a few words about the about the toy model, 
which is the Poisson semigroup. So let's define the Poisson semigroup. Uh, and so we can think that the Poisson semigroup is defined using the Fourier multiplier. And on the Fourier transform side, this is defined using this multiplier. This is e2 minus 2 pi L times the norm of C, where L here, this is the isotropic constant. So I, 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 I put this L here because uh, from some technical reasons, it will be um, important later. So therefore, this is, this, this is the, 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 the rescaled version of the, of the Poisson semigroup. And so what is important that if we consider the maximal function corresponding to the Poisson semigroup or the um, square function, this, this, which is defined using this G, G function, then Stein showed that for every P between one and infinity, there exists a constant which depends on P, only on P and is independent of the dimension that we have these two kind of bound, these two, two bounds, that the, the maximal function corresponding to the Poisson semigroup is, uh, in, is bounded on LP and the bounds is independent of the dimension as well as um, the same bound is true for, uh, for the um, square function. And here, uh, there is a simple observation which says that if we, because we know that the Poisson semigroup, if we take a look at the physical space, this is, it's defined using the radially decreasing function. So therefore we have a simple bound that the, the maximal function corresponding to the Poisson semigroup can be pointwisely controlled by the hard delete with maximal operator over the Euclidean balls. And we have, we have this, this bound. So therefore this implies that, that the best constant in the, um, uh, in the Poisson semigroup is controlled by the best constant in the hard delete with maximal Mm, average. And therefore, that was, I, I remember that they had a conversation with Stein some time ago, and, and that, was, that was the starting point of uh, when he started to think about this dimension-free problem. Mm, that was this inequality. And, and so he, he wanted to know whether it's possible to, to reverse this inequality in some sense. And, and so, and, and he wanted to, to know if we are able to estimate the best constant in the hard little maximal uh, function in terms of the norm of the maximal function corresponding to the Poisson semigroup. And in fact, this is what Bourguin showed in his proof. It's in some sense, uh, he, he answered affirmatively to this question and, and he showed that this is possible. And I, I will show you in a moment um, how, how the argument uh, goes, uh, but this is what is important. Here are the estimate in our argument. This is what would be important are the estimates for the Fourier uh, transform corresponding to our averaging operator. And so our hard delete with averaging operator on the Fourier transform side corresponds to the uh, multiplier, uh, which um, which is the characteristic function of, 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 the, of the convex symmetric body. So here we assume that our convex symmetric bodies is normalized to have mass one. And so a uh, remarkable result of Bourguin uh, is are the, this is the, the following theorem which shows, which provides the, the estimates of, for this Fourier multiplier in terms of the isotropic constant. So he was able to show that if we have a symmetric convex body which has volume one and which is in the isotropic position, so then there exists a constant such that for every vector we have the following bounds. So this bounds correspond, this is just the van der Korput estimate at infinity. Mm, so, and uh, uh, the second estimate, this is the, it says that, that our multiplier is small at the origin. And, and the last estimate says that, that we can control the derivative of our multiplier independent of the dimension. And so here in these two estimates, it's important that this isotropic con constant um, is attached to the, to the, to the vector uh, C. Um, and so now 
let me show you how, how this can be combined with the estimates for the Poisson semi-group to derive the dimension-free estimates for the, for, let's assume for a moment that, that, that uh, let's focus our attention for a moment on the lacunary version of, of our hardy liquid maximal um, operator. So, uh, so we start, so we want to estimate the, the, the maximal function, um, um, uh, the following maximal function. So this is what we do, we add and subtract the Poisson semi-group at the lacunary times. And this guy can be estimated um, with a constant which is independent of the dimension because of the result of Stein. And now we have to take care of the, of the difference. And now this difference uh, behaves a little bit better because now we can control, uh, of course, this two separately if we consider M2 to the N and, and the Poisson semi-group, then we, they have good bounds on the Fourier transform sites at, the, at infinity, but uh, we subtract um, this operator because we want to improve uh, the behavior of this operator at, at, the, at the origin. And this is, this is why we consider this difference. And now instead of, um, instead of working with the maximal function, we, um, uh, we will try to estimate the larger object that the, the, the square function corresponding to this, to this difference. So therefore we have to show, so our, our task will be accomplished when we show that this uh, square function is bounded on L2 with a constant which is independent of the dimension. But now this is, but now uh, here, um, mm, uh, our problem is very simple because we can appeal, we can use the Plancherel theorem when we can appeal to the estimates of the, for the Fourier transform from the previous slide. And so, and now we see that, that this difference, so we have van der Korput estimate at infinity uh, for, for this multiplier. And this is the estimates of this form. And the same estimates holds for the, for the multiplier corresponding to the Poisson semi-group because this is some exponential function. And now when we subtract one from this, we know that this function behaves nicely at the origin and this is, uh, it, it's controlled by, by this quantity. And the same when we subtract one from the, from the Poisson semi-group, we also know that this is, um, this is controlled by this quantity. So therefore this, uh, mm, this, uh, sum is controlled by, um, by the minimum of, of two geometric um, sequences of this form. And now we see, uh, so, and here is the place where it's important that this isotropic constant is at, attached to this vector C. And so here is important that, um, that we were able to, to provide the estimates um, for the hardy liquid multiplier in terms of the isotropic constant with this isotropic constant attached to C. And here is also important why we rescale this Poisson semi-group uh, by this isotropic constant, because we also want to have this isotropic constant here. And now if you sum the geometric series, then it turns out that uh, the ultimate bound is independent of, the, of, of LG times the, the norm of C and, and we are done. So this is how we obtain the L2 theory. And um, mm, okay, so, and now let me tell you how from this lacunary case, we can pass to the, to the general case. And for this purpose, we can, we can appeal to, to a very simple inequality, which usually it's called the rademacher menshoff argument. It's very well known in the theory of Fourier series. So it says that the, the maximal function of this form, so assume that we have a sequence which is defined on some dyadic block takes values in some complex plane. And, and it turns out that if we, if we take a look at the maximal function in this dyadic block, then it's controlled by the sum of the square functions of this, of this form. And now if we, if we use this inequality, so now if we, if we want to pass from the, from the lacunary case to the full uh, maximal function, then, then it suffices in view of some Liquid Paley theory, it suffices 
everything is reduced to, to understand the, the behavior of the maximal function in this dyadic block. Because if we, if we know that if we will be able to provide the dimension-free estimates for the um, maximal function um, in the dyadic block, then, then, then we can use the, the square function argument and, and, and everything can be extended to the, to, the, to, the, to the general case when the supremum is taken over all times all positive times. So, and now in this uh, dyadic uh, block, the maximal function, this is what we do, we add and subtract the, the, our um, averaging operator with t equal um, uh, to, the, to the n, which is one of the endpoints. And so, and when we do this, then we know that this is a contraction. So this is, this is bounded by, by LP norm of F. And now here we apply this, this inequality, this, this rather macher of argument. And we, we got to, and now the matters are reduced to, to estimate the, um, uh, um, this square function. And, and we have to, we have to obtain some, some gain in, in L, which will be summable. If we will be able to do this, then our problem will be, uh, will be accomplished. So, and let me show you how to do that. So, so we, we, this is what we do. We, uh, on L1, we just trivially use the triangle inequality and we estimate this, this object by um, the number of terms in this sum. So this is two to the L, this is why we have this, uh, this growth to do the L because we have to to do the L elements in this sum, and and now in order to and now we hope that we are able to um, improve this bound on L two uh, and in fact here is the place where we use this this third bound from Burgen's theorem and and this here is important that we are able to control with some constant which is independent of the dimension. Um, of, of, the, of the derivative of our Fourier multiplier. And this, uh, if, we, if we pass, if we use the Planchard theorem and we appeal to this, to this bound and we use the mean value theorem, then it turns out that we are able to control this. We, we, we can gain. And, and this is what we gain, this is, this is of this form. It's two to the minus L over two. Uh, and now if we interpolate these two bounds, then it turns out that this is summable Mm, as long as p is bigger than three half. So this, this follows from, from a simple uh, interpolation and this is how we get this. Uh, and this is, so I, I, I described the, um, so I recovered the, the, the proof of, of Bourguet and Carberry uh, for the dimension free, showing that di dimension free estimates for, for p bigger than three half. And now let me tell you, something about uh, what happens if we uh, consider the optimal constant in the hardy liquid uh, maximal operator in the discrete setup and in the continuous setup. And it turns out that, that the uh, continuous optimal constant from the hardy liquid inequality for all convex symmetric bodies and for all p's be between one and infinity, including endpoints, is controlled by the discrete optimal inequality from the, from the discrete hardy liquid mm, maximal inequality. For p equal one, of course, this, is, uh, this, this corresponds to the, to, the, to the optimal constant in the, in the weak type one, one estimate. And, uh, and moreover, uh, if uh, we consider um, the, the, the Euclidean, cubes, then it turns out that we have equality for p equal one here in this case. And the first inequality, um, so exhibits a well-known phenomenon in harmonic analysis, which states that, it, that it's harder to establish bounds for the discrete operators than for the, than the bounds for the, for, the con, for the continuous counterparts. And the, the second identity so this is very, very interesting result because it says that, that there is no difference between the behavior of the opt optimal constant in the um, continuous and discrete setup. And for instance, in, in view of the result of um, uh, 
um, ALDAS, we know that, uh, so ALDAS showed that, that this constant, when D goes to infinity, explodes. It's also, it also tends to infinity. So therefore, in view of this result, the same holds in the, in the discrete setup. And also, we have some quantitative bounds in view of the result of Yakovlev and Stromberg, who showed that uh, this, um, the, the continuous optimal constant has a bound like the dimension to one quarter from below. Mm, uh, and of course, now using this identity, we can we can transfer this 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 bound to the um, to the discrete setup, and we also have that that the discrete optimal constant is bigger than the dimension to the one quarter. And finally, this also says that if dimension is equal one, and we appeal to the famous result of Mellas, we know which says that the the continuous that the optimal constant for the um, continuous hardy litwood uh, operator on, on the real line um, is equal to the largest root of the quadratic uh, equation, which is of this form, 12 times c squared minus 22 c plus five. So if we take the largest root of this, of this equation, then this is precisely the norm of the hardy litwood averaging operators. Mm, symmetric hardy litwood averaging operator on, on the real line. And, and the same uh, remains true for the, in the discrete setup. So, mm, uh, okay, and now, now there is a question, if we can, if we are able to reverse this inequality. So if, if we are able to, 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 to show that, that possibly some, at the expense of some multiplicative constant, for instance, if we are able to, to, to say that the, the continuous, if we ask whether the discrete optimal constant can be, can be controlled from above in terms of the um, continuous um, um, uh, optimal constant from the hardy liquid um, inequality, maximal inequality. And, uh, yeah, so the answer is to a to, to certain extent, it's, uh, it's possible to reverse this inequality, but uh, I will show you the, the example that, that this is, that will um, illustrate that this is, in general, this is, this is not true. And uh, so this also shows some, some new phenomenon that the dimension free estimates in the, in the discrete setup are, are not as broad uh, as in the in the continuous setup, so I, I will tell you in a moment about that. So uh, let's uh, okay. Let's consider the uh, our discrete averaging operator uh, on ZD. Uh, so uh, let so uh, rec we recall that this is the average over the lattice points in in the dilated convex symmetric body and. So our first result, um, uh, which allows us to reverse the, the inequality that we discussed on the previous slide is the following. So let's uh, consider the unit ball in RD, which is centered at the origin and let's define the, 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 the following quantity. This is the smallest, smallest parameter T such that the dilated convex body contains this, this this unit cube centered at the origin. And then it turns out that for every P, the following inequality holds. If we take the supremum over all radii, which, is, which are bigger than C of G times the dimension, then we, this norm can be controlled by the norm of the corresponding continuous averaging operator times the norm of the function f in, in LP. And this, and this constant here is, as we see, it's, this is a numerical constant, it's independent of the dimension. And in the case of the Q balls, we are able to calculate what the C B of Q is. And this is, this is equal to two times the dimension to one over Q. So therefore in the case of, um, in the case of the Euclidean balls, if Q is equal to, then we see that if the radius 
radius is bigger than D to three half, then we have bounds that are independent of the dimension. So therefore this inequality tells us that the dimension free phenomenon in the continuous setup is only important if the, if the, if the radii, radii are small. And so therefore, if, if something may go wrong, so therefore we have to, we have to try to, 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 to find a counterexample when the, when the radii uh, are small. And, and in fact, uh, this is, uh, so our next theorem uh, says that, uh, that we have an example of a convex symmetric body uh, for which um, dimension free estimate in the, for the discrete hardy liquid maximal function um, doesn't hold. Mm. And so let me tell you, so let's consider uh, the following ellipsoid. So we fix some sequence between one and square root of two, and let's define the ellipsoid in this way. And so from, from the previous example, so, uh, the, the, so from, from the previous theorem, the previous theorem I, I, I call the previous theorem, the comparison principle, we are able to, to show that if G is, uh, mm, if is this, this ellipsoid, then one has for every p bigger than three half that there is a there exists a constant which is independent of the dimension such that the maximal function over all times which are bigger than the dimension to three half is bounded mm, and and this bound is independent of the dimension so mm, and this 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 result this first inequality can be derived from the from the previous result from this comparison principle um, and but but if we ask about the optimal constant in the full maximal inequality, then it turns out that, that this, this constant uh, explodes as D goes to the dimension. And in, in one of the results with Bourguin-Stein and, and Vrubel, we showed that for every P, there exists a constant which, is, uh, which depends on P, but it's independent of the dimension such that we have the lower bound for this. Uh, for this optimal constant in this uh, in the in the hard with maximal inequality in the discrete setup corresponding to this this family of ellipsoids and this and this this lower bound is, is logarithmic in d so and, and in fact in this we, is in this in this form this is the logarithm d to one over p and so therefore uh, this shows that that uh, this phenomenon shows, phenomenon shows that uh, mm, the dimension free estimates, as I said, are, are not as broad as in the continuous setup, but, uh, but we have also some positive results. And so, and let me tell you about the positive results. So if we consider the, the, the discrete bo the ball, mm, the discrete ball in RD, um, sorry, uh, the discrete cube in uh, in RD uh, and, and the corresponding hard liquid uh, discrete hard liquid averaging operator. Then it turns out that when p is bigger than three half, this is the range as in Carberry and Bourguin, Bourguin theorem. Then there exists a constant which only depends on p and it's independent of the dimension such that the full maximal function corresponding to the discrete averaging operator over, over discrete cubes is, is bounded. And moreover, if we restrict the supremum to the dyadic times, this inequality can be improved and, and the range of P can be extended to the, to the sharp range of, um, of P and, 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 and we have this, um, <clears throat> this inequality with bounds um, which are independent of the of the dimension and so let me tell you a few words about the about the proof so so this in fact our result uh, so we can we can follow this the scheme that they described um, in the context of the continuous um, um, estimates uh, for for ge general convex symmetric bodies 
So this is what we do. We take a look at the averaging at the multiplier corresponding to our average, and this is the um, this is the nor normalized partial sum. Uh, and so here it's very important that that the the cubes have product structure. So this multiplier can be very precisely calculated. And this is this is the Dirichlet kernel. And and now working with this with this object, we can show that the following three estimates. This is the analog of Burgen's theorem, which are uh, mm, from the from the continuous setup. So so we have the van der Korput estimate, which is uh, which is of this form. We we know that when we subtract one, then then our multiplier is small at the origin, small in the following sense. And here, this is this bound corresponds to the derivative estimates. That here we have we handle the only the discrete times, so therefore um, it's it's more reasonable to 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 express um, the the corresponding derivative estimates from the Bourguin theorem uh, in terms of the difference. So and this is. This is this is small in the in the following sense that this is like the constant over n, and um, so and and when we when we use this this estimates and we and when we appeal to the scheme that they described before, then uh, we see that uh, then, then then we are able to to obtain our our result. And now, let me speculate a little bit about the general case. So if we consider, so let's think that now we. We would like to understand the, the, the situation of the cue balls. And here, what is important that, so we expect that the, the bounds should be uh, described in the terms of the proportionality factor. Uh, and this proportionality factor, this is the n over d to one over q. And, and this, uh, this quantity, may be identified with the isotropic constant corresponding to the Q balls um, if the normalization assumption in the definition of the, <clears throat> of the isotropic constant is dropped. So if we, if we uh, so that, that then if we, if we drop this assumption that, the, that our body is normalized to have mass one, then the isotropic constant is comparable with this, with this proportionality factor. And now, if we could prove that there exists a constant which is independent of the dimension, um, such that for every n and every c from the d-dimensional torus, we have this van der Korput estimate at infinity for our multiplier, and we are able to show that this multiplier is small at the origin in the following sense, and if we control the, the, the discrete derivative in the following sense, then the method that I discussed would give us Dimension free estimates for the optimal constant in the in the discrete setup for all p bigger than three half. But uh, yeah, but then unfortunately, it seems that it's a it's a very hard problem. And uh, so so far, we don't know how to do this except one case, the the case of of balls. We can say something. Which is reminiscent to, to to this what we what we speculate here, and um, so you see, okay, I, I have also one comment that if if we if we assume that q is equal to infinity, then this proportionality constant is equal to n. So this this bounds that we have here they correspond to the bounds for the um, for the cubes from the previous slide. So, 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 so this is, uh, this is the, the, the analog of, um, of, the, of the estimate that we obtained in the case of cubes. And so now if we, so now let's focus our attention on, on the Euclidean balls. And it turns out that <clears throat> if we consider a truncated version of our maximal function, discrete maximal function over corresponding to the averaging operators over Euclidean balls. And if the supremum is bigger than the dimension. So our comparison principle that we proved at the beginning says that if the, if the, if the time parameter is bigger than the dimension to three half, then we have dimension free estimates. So in, in the result with Burgenstein and Rubel, we, 
were able, in the case of the Euclidean balls, we were able to improve this, uh, this, this bound, and we were able to, to, to um, extend the, the, the range over which the supremum is taken. But also, we were able to show that if we consider the dyadic version of, of our average, and p is bigger than 2, bigger or equal 2, then we have the bounds that are the, that are independent of the dimension. So this is this is uh, exhibited by this inequality. Uh, and in fact, this by interpolation, this this result is purely L two because we interpolate with the trivial L infinity estimate. So from now on, we can think that this is this is uh, uh, only uh, L two estimate. And now let me let me give you a few words about the proof. So. Uh, it's tempting to, to, to compare the, um, our, um, our con continuous, our, our discrete multiplier with its continuous counterpart. So, so we, we would like to control the difference in terms of the isotropic constant, this proportionality constant. And, and in fact, it's possible to do this as long as the, the radius is bigger than d to power three half. But this is not interesting because we know in this in this range from this comparison principle, we know that this um, that we have uh, bounds which are independent of the dimension. So so therefore, this is not um, um, uh, not interesting here. And in order to get a, a better control. Mm. One has to understand the, the number of lattice points in the in the Euclidean ball, uh, uh, in the in the Euclidean balls, and mm, so in general, when the dimension is bigger or equal five, then we know that the number of lattice points, this is is equal to the radius to power dimension times the volume volume of the Euclidean ball. Normal times the volume of the unit uh, Euclidean ball plus the error term, and the error term is it behaves like t to the dimension minus two. And <clears throat> but uh, unfortunately, this this result uh, is not sufficient for our purposes. And the, the problem is that in, in in our case we need to know that the error term is in the multiplicative form, which is in the form of this. Uh, um, so we are, we are interested in, in, the, in the multiplicative error term. Uh, and here, of course, when the dimension is fixed, then this, this multiplicative error term can be derived from the, from the additive error term. But when we ask, ask about the uniformity in the dimension, then, then, then then this is it's a quite subtle question, and because you know, here the implicit constant um, may depend on the dimension. So, but we want to know that the implicit constant is is independent of the dimension. And um, so, if we if we had answers to, if we had an answer to this question, then we would be able to, to say something about this, uh, about the estimates for the, um, for the Fourier multiplier corresponding to our average. But unfortunately at this moment, this is, um, uh, it's a very hard problem from, from number theory. And so therefore, so when we started to, to work on this problem, we um, realized that instead of the, the approach through the, the number of lattice points is, is not appropriate. And we started to think about, about the symmetries. And it turns out that the balls have very nice symmetries. So they are invariant under the action of, of permutation group. So in the following sense, if we take a, a permutation and if we take any vector from, from the ball and we permute its uh, coordinates, then this is again an element from in this ball. And moreover, if we, if we take any vector in our ball and we change the signs of its entries, then this is, this is again an element of, of, of our 
um, our ball. And if we if we exploit this to sim to, to kind of symmetries, then um, we can think that our averaging operator, instead of averaging over the lattice points in balls, we can average over the elements in the in the in the symmetry group and try to exploit the fact that the dimension tends to infinity, that the dimension can be taken as large as we want. And if we use this, uh, this idea, then some kind of um, estimates are, can be derived. For instance, uh, we are able to show that our multiplier, when we subtract one, is small at the origin in this sense, in, in, the, in the sense that, 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 we, that is required to, to obtain the bounds which are um, uh, independent of the dimension in terms of this isotropic, uh, discrete isotropic constant. And moreover, when n is between d and square root of d, then we are able to control our multiplier by the part that, by the van der Korput estimate. So this is, this is the part that is conjectured. But unfortunately, here we have some, some error term, which is, which is the, the, the negative power of this isotropic constant. And, <clears throat> and if, we, if n, if the radii um, are smaller than the square root of the dimension, then we have this sophisticated bound for the uh, for for our multiplier, and so how how much time do I have? Yeah, usually uh, it's usually around fifty minutes long, but uh, we're gonna let you finish. Okay, so okay, so let me let me tell you, let me try to explain the the, the last bound because this is uh, this is very mm, mm, here. There is a very nice story with this, uh, which which lies behind all this this last bound. So, um, so it turns out that uh, when, when the radius is smaller than the square root of D, then the balls behave like the Hamming cube. So the Hamming cube can be identified with the, with the space of all sequences with entry, entries minus one, zero, and one of length D. And then our multiplier, uh, instead of uh, averaging Mm, over the, the, the lattice points in balls, we can, we can average over the, the, the <clears throat> elements in, in the Hamming cube. And now the Hamming cube has the same kind of symmetries, is also invariant under the per permutation. So therefore this, this average now can be, mm, instead of averaging over the, the mm, sequences in, in our Hamming cube, we can average over the mm, group of symmetries. Uh, and and then here, if we use a little bit of, of of Fourier analysis, then it turns out that this this object, this sum, uh, <coughs> this is convex um, combination of Kraftchuk polynomials. The Kraftchuk polynomials are are the polynomials of this form, and So we can think that that there, this is this um, this uh, polynomials are very close to the hypergeometric distribution, and and now when we use <clears throat> and and the Kraftchuk polynomials have some nice properties, and this is what is most important for us. This is the bound at infinity, which is of this form, and now. If we appeal to this to this to this bound, then we are able to uh, to obtain this uh, this estimate for the Fourier uh, multiplier at, at at infinity, and that was uh, mm, that was important in, in our uh, our approach that we were able to, to to see that when the radii are small are smaller than the square root of the of the dimension, then the ball behaves like the, the lattice points in the ball behaves like the um, like the um, um, sequences from the Hamming cube and that was uh, that was critical uh, in, in, in our argument and finally let me mention that recently we were able to uh, to extend this this result uh, 
um, to to the following to the spherical uh, discrete spherical averaging operator. So here now we consider the average over the the spheres uh, in ZD, and and then it turns out that um, if we take a look at the maximal function corresponding to the dyadic version of this um, of this average, then it's bounded uh, with uh, bounds which are uh, independent of the dimension for every p bigger or equal to. And here in this approach, so he, here in this proof, <clears throat> we had to refine the, um, um, the circle method, uh, which, uh, which is a critical ingredient in the proof. And so as a result, we were able to obtain um, the asymptotic formula for the number of lattice points in the, in the sphere which uh, in some sense, uh, it's independent of the dimension. I, I'm, I'm, I want to say that we were able to derive the asymptotic formula with the multi multiplicative error term. And we know, we also were able to detect the, the range of, of radii uh, for which uh, the implicit constant in the error term is independent of, of D. So, so that's the that's the new ingredient which is which is needed to um, to to obtain uh, to obtain this 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 inequality. So this paper is is essentially finished. So it will be in a few days on on archive. So, okay. So that was my last slide. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, it's good time to take a break. <laughs> Thank you, Marius, for this very nice talk. Um, are there any questions for Marius? I can jump in. This is Michael Lacey. Hi, Marios. Hi, Michael. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Um, on this last one, you you restricted to the lacunary radii for the spheres. I suppose the extending it beyond that might be kind of difficult. Because of the yes, instrument. it's 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 very difficult. And let me explain why. Where is the difficulty? So if you if you consider the the um, number of lattice points. So if you, uh, so we know that the number of lattice points, um, we have asymptotic formula for the number of lattice points. And so this is, this is some gamma function times n to the dimension over two minus one, where n, this is the radii, and times the arithmetic series, singular series, which also depends on n. And this singular series, uh, behaves very, ir ir it's very, it's a, it's a very irregular function. So for some oh. radii, you can think that this is, this corresponds to the number of, of divisors um, for the underlying uh, function. So if you, if you want to understand, so here, if, if one wants to extend our problem from the lacunary to the non-lacunary case, one has to understand the, the, the difference of Mm, of our averaging operator taken at point n plus one minus averaging operator evaluated at point n. And then everything in some sense can be reduced to, to the behavior of the singular, of the difference of the singular series. So, so we have to understand the, the difference of the singular series at n plus one minus n. But if we think that this is, this behaves like the, <clears throat> like the, Mm, divisor function. So we can imagine that we, we may have some radius for which we have many divisors, but, and let's say that this is a number n, but for n plus one, we may have only two if this is a prime, for instance. Right. Sure. And, and that's, the, that's the problem. So it seems that this is, this is a very hard problem. And at, at this moment, we don't know how to, how to, how to handle the general case. So yeah, so this this what we were able to do. This is only L2 and lacunary because we were able to say something for the estimates for our multiplier at the origin and at, at infinity. And this is this is uh, it's enough to 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 obtain L2 theory. But apart from that, we don't know. 
May I ask a question? Yeah. It's Eugene, Eugene Shargorotsky. Oh, hi. hi, Eugene. Hi, Mariusz, how are you? <laughs> uh, this question about the lower estimate that you had uh, in the case of the ellipsoid. So when yeah. you don't restrict T to, uh, I mean, uh, so when, when you allow T to go to zero. So you yes. have a uh, lower estimate with a power of logarithm. Yes. Is it believed that this is the, the power of logarithm and this power of logarithm is the right power? Is it what you expect to have? Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't, that, I, I don't what know. What characteristics yeah, we have, yeah, of we have, the, we have no idea what the what the right um, okay what the right exponent should be. And you know, this is also you you, you touch very interesting question because if we have if we have ellipsoid, so so this is very. Uh, so you can think that this is not symmetric. So here for this, in, in, we, we think that, you know, in order to have this dimension free estimates, then the, the, the underlying body must be, must be symmetric in every dimension. So in must, be, must be invariant under the, per, the, the action of this permutation group. Otherwise, you know, you may have some directions where you have much more amount of mass and there you have some other directions where, where, where this amount of mass is very small. And this is the reason why we have this, um, this when this dimension free phenomenon breaks down here in this, um, in this discrete setup. But regarding to your question about the right exponent from below, no, we don't, we don't know. Marish, and another one, um, I have absolutely no intuition here. So uh, what, is, what, what is important as far as the properties are concerned of this averaging operator, the geometry of the boundary of your set, say the, I don't know, uh, curvature or anything like that. When you look at the body, when do you expect uh, the averaging operator to behave badly? You just answered part of it, but what else? I mean, apart from sort of- Yeah, so, so, so for instance, in the, in, the, in the case of the balls, it was important that that you know that the essential amount of mass was was concentrated near the boundary, but here in this in this case in the discrete setup, this is yeah this 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 intuition also doesn't it doesn't work. So um, yeah so yeah this discrete setup is completely completely different. Okay, thank you. Hi, Marius. Thanks for the great talk. Uh, Hi. What is known when um, uh, in the discrete setup for Euclidean balls? I, I missed, perhaps you mentioned, what, what's the, is it known that there is dimension independent bound? Sorry, say, say again. Uh, for the discrete setup for Euclidean balls. Yes. Uh, what is known? Okay, so this is, this is what we what we know. So let me let me go go back to my uh, to the slide where we um, uh, okay. This is here. So yeah, we but know we have that t greater no for t greater than zero. If you take supreme overall. No, this is this is this is unknown. So ah, this okay. is still open. Okay. Yeah, that's what I wanted. Thank you. This is still open, and and you know, in this case, I believe that this may be the same kind of difficulty as as in the spheres, because we also have to understand the difference of the um, of the averaging operator at evaluated at n plus one minus the averaging operator evaluated at time t, and we expect that this should behave like c over n when c uh, is uh, uh, some constant independent of the dimension, but but at this moment we don't know how to how to show, how to how to prove that. The only the only case the only known case for which we know this is this is the case of the of the balls. And here in this case, uh, we believe that uh, there should be bounds which are dimension which are dimension free uh, for, um, for all P bigger than one in the, in the case of, of the, uh, sorry, of the cubes. And, and here, um, you know, this, this is what is, the, so this bound, uh, this kind of bound we would like to have in the case of cue balls or in particular 
um, Euclidean balls, but um, at the moment it, it seems that this is this is this is uh, not available. But in the case of cubes, we were able to derive this bound because you know we very um, we highly exploited the uh, the fact that the cubes have um, product structure. All right, thank you. Um, are there any further questions for Marius? Okay, if not, then let's thank him again. And um, I'm going to stop the recording and see you all next week. Thank you.